you so very much. Are you saying that at your dad's funeral? I'm impressed that you're able to get that out at your dad's funeral. <laughs> Breaking of the kingdom. We started this last week. You've heard about King Saul, who was chosen by God, who was head and shoulders above all others. You've heard about how he rebelled against God time and time again until eventually God told him that he would not establish a line of kings that would last, not through Saul at least. But have you heard the rest of the story? You've heard about King David, who was anointed by Samuel, who faced Goliath, who was hunted by Saul, who was friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. You've heard many of the Psalms that David wrote, some of them likely as he was a shepherd boy. You've heard about how he committed adultery with Bathsheba and then committed murder to try to cover up his crime. And have you heard the rest of the story? You've heard about Solomon and his wives. You've heard of his wisdom, his wit, his power. You've probably seen pictures of the temple he built, read about his wealth, his ability to arbitrate a dispute. You may have read about the Queen of Sheba who came to Jerusalem having heard about Solomon's wisdom and she was astounded at what she saw. But have you heard the rest of the story? You've heard about how the reign of these kings was the golden age of Israel. How they ruled from Egypt to the Euphrates River. How they were wealthy and secure to a degree unseen before or since. But have you heard how it all came tumbling down. Have you heard the rest of the story? The story of the splitting of the kingdom of Israel into two kingdoms, one called Judah, one retaining the name Israel, is a tragic story. It tells of a king who neglected his duties as a father. It tells of a king who married women from other nations that did not follow the one true God and thus allowed them to influence not only himself, but also his son, the one who would follow him on the throne. Just as we saw how Solomon ended badly, this morning I want to look at the one who followed, who began badly and never really recovered from it. This was the beginning of... Of a, of a journey that would end in Babylon. When the Jewish people were sent into exile, it began, that story, that road to Babylon begins really here with Solomon and Rehoboam. Open up your Bibles, if you could please, to 2 Chronicles chapter 10, beginning in verse 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 10, beginning in verse 6. <coughs> Solomon had died. He had been king over Israel for 40 years. He had built the temple. He had a palace there in Jerusalem that was absolutely magnificent, they say. But in the end, as all men and women do, his body expired and he was laid to rest there somewhere near the city. And then his son, Rehoboam, was set to inherit the throne. Solomon had been told before he died that the kingdom would be taken from his family. Not from him personally. For the sake of his father, David, God said, I'll wait until after you pass, but it will be taken from your son. It wasn't too long after that that there was a man by the name of Jeroboam. He was one of the officials in Solomon's kingdom, the head of some of the workforces. And the prophet came to him and said, Here's my cloak. I have torn it in twelve pieces. Take ten of them. And Jeroboam did. And the prophet said, Just as you have taken ten pieces of this cloak, you will be given ten pieces, ten tribes of the nation of Israel. Word got out. Solomon heard that Jeroboam had been prophesied that would become a king over some of the tribes. And so he exiled Jeroboam. Jeroboam left, went to Egypt, and stayed there until he heard that Solomon had died. And then he came back to see what would happen. 
And all the people gathered together in a place. And the people came to Rehoboam. And they said, your father was a great and mighty king. He built many buildings. He fortified many cities. But the taxes that he imposed on us are killing us. If you will reduce the taxes down. They didn't say you got to do away with them. They just said reduce them down to a more manageable level. And we will follow you and love you just as we followed your father. But do something about these taxes. They're killing us. And so he said, give me some time. On the third day, we will gather together. If this was happening on the first day, the passage we're going to read is going to take place on the second day. And then on the third day, he would announce his decision. Picking up in 2 Chronicles chapter, chapter 10, beginning in verse 6. Then Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon while he was still alive, saying, How do you counsel me to answer this people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you will be kind to this people and please them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the elders which they had given him and consulted with the young men who grew up with him and served him. So he said to them, What counsel do you give that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Like the oak which your father put on us? And the young men grew up with, who grew up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall say to the people who spoke to you, saying, Your father made, made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter for us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplines you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Return to me on the third day. And the king answered them harshly. And King Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the elders. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to it. My father disciplined you with whips, I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people for his return of events from God, that the Lord might establish his word, which he spoke to Ahasia the, the Shilonite, to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. And when all of Israel saw the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to your tents, O Israel. Now look after your own house, David. So all Israel departed to their tents. But as for the sons of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. The king Rehoboam sent Hadoram, who was over the forced labor to the sons of Israel, and the sons of Israel stoned him to death. The king Rehoboam made haste to mount his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. Amen and amen. Over the years, there have been many blunders by many leaders which have led to consequences that were unforeseen. President William Henry Harrison refused to wear a hat to his inauguration even though the winter months was cold. He caught pneumonia and died a month later. He served one month as President of the United States because he didn't want to wear a hat. We have seen leaders do foolish things, sparking rebellion, sparking revolts, you had Napoleon invaded Russia with his grand army only to have it shattered and broken. You had Adolf Hitler try the same thing a little over 100 years later, and he had basically the same result. What Rehoboam here does ranks right up there on levels of stupidity, if I may put it nicely. The people gather together and they say, if you'll just back off on these taxes, we will love you. We will follow you. He stands to inherit the throne and in three days manages to split the entire kingdom in two, just as God had told Solomon would happen. Understand, God allowed this to happen. God could have intervened. God could have spoken to Rehoboam just as, as he had spoken to Solomon. He could have sent fire down from heaven. But he said, no. I'm going to stand back. I'm going to give Rehoboam several lengths of rope. And I'm going to let him hang himself with it. And that's basically what happened. In doing so, Rehoboam gives us an example on how not to start off well. Last week we looked at how to end well. Now I want to look at how to start well. My wife told me, says, you're getting on a horse. Well, that's the order that's in the scripture. And so that's what we're going to go with. 
He begins in, in verse 6. King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon while he was still alive. These are the men who had experience. These are the men who have been around for years. They knew the people. They understood politics. They understood economics. They understand and understood how to get things to work. And he asked them, what would you have me do? And he said, speak kindly to them. Lower the taxes. Let them know you care about them. And yes, we believe they will follow you. They give them good advice. But notice what Rehoboam does. He gets a second opinion. You ever gotten a second opinion from somewhere? You know why people get second opinion sometimes? When they go, like, for example, to the dentist office? You know why they get second opinions? Because they don't like the first opinion. And sometimes there's reason to do that. Uh, Dusty went to this back 15 years ago when we were in South Georgia. She went to the dentist, and the dentist says, you need 16 cavities. We were a little bit skeptical. And so we got a second opinion. We went to another dentist, the dentist that I'd known for years back in my hometown, and he said, okay, here are the two you got to do now. Here's the two you might as well go and do now. The rest of them, nah, not so much. Rehoboam was every bit as skeptical, even though the elders had given him some really good advice. <laughs> Rehoboam apparently gathered them together. And said, what would you have me do? This group over here says, be nice to them. This one over here says, load them up. Go after them. Show them who's boss. And Rehoboam rejected the counsel of the elders. Why? Because the elders didn't tell him what he already wanted to hear. I firmly believe that when the people came to Rehoboam and said, okay, we want you to lower our taxes, he's like, nah, I don't think so. I think part of the problem was that Rehoboam was still living in his father's shadow. He felt like he had to prove himself. It's really dangerous when the leader feels like they need to prove themselves. Rehoboam had no interest in godly counsel. He wanted an affirmation for what he already planned. If there's one thing I've learned in ministry is there going to be times when I don't have all the answers to something. I have learned that I do well to seek out people who know things that I don't know. Whether it be, you know, the deacons for something, the properties committee for something, the finance committee for something. I also discovered it made my life a lot easier when I was willing to admit that. Rehoboam hadn't quite figured that part out yet. He had no interest in godly counsel. The trick is, of course, to find the right person to have that has the answer. If we would begin well in whatever ministry, whatever part of our life we're in, number one, we need to seek out godly counsel. Rehoboam wasn't interested in any kind of godly counsel unless it just happened to line up with what he already wanted to do. We cannot succeed if our pride is allowed to guide our decisions, which is part of what was happening here. If you're looking for godly counsel, look at the Bible. Turn to men and women of faith who have been there. And above all, pray without ceasing. God does not intend any of us to be Lone Ranger Christians. Y'all know who the Lone Ranger was, don't you? Oh, yeah. How many of you watched Lone Ranger when you were a kid? Okay, I watched it. One of our favorites. I never saw the movie, and from what I understand, I don't think I missed that terribly much. But it was about a guy off on his own. He had his companion, Tonto. They would bring... You know, truth and justice to the American West. That's not what we're called to be. We're called to be an assembly of disciples, encouraging one another, Amen. giving counsel to one another, building one another up. We need to seek out godly counsel. Looking at verse 10, the young men who grew up with him spoke to him. Here's what you're going to say. Your father made our yoke heavy. My little finger has got more strength than my father had. He says, the, people, the young men tell him, if you think my father was tough, oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. You think he was tough? Wait until you see what I do. And that's exactly what Rehoboam did. Here's where Rehoboam could have taken a page 
from his grandfather's book. When David was threatened by Absalom, when Absalom was rebelling, sort of like what the people are here, he just kind of went with it. He made every attempt to avoid harming Absalom. He got out of his way. He let God fight his battles because he said, God put me on the throne. It's up to God to keep me on the throne. And if God wants to move me off the throne, that's fine. Because I trust God more than I trust myself. Rehoboam doesn't do that. You see, David, in bending to the wind, so to speak, like he did before Absalom, provides an image of Christ. Christ who did not feel the need to demonstrate his power to anyone, demonstrate who he was, but as far as putting on a show, no. As far as proclaiming himself to be the ruler of the world, no. Rehoboam chooses the wrong role model. He chooses his father Solomon, which wasn't necessarily a bad choice, except he chose the wrong part of Solomon's personality to emulate the part that prompted the Israelites to make this request to begin with. We all have role models, whether we realize it or not, people that we choose to imitate and to copy. The Apostle Paul told the Corinthians to follow his example because he followed the example of Christ. If we would begin well, number one, we have to seek out godly counsel, and number two, we have to use Christ as a role model. Willie Nelson once supposedly told his kids, look at everything that I did and do something different. Which is just another roundabout saying, be like Christ. We all need role models. The question is, who do we choose? Paul explained to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 5, he says, take on the mind of Christ. Take on the attitude of Christ. For the Christian, that is the most important verse in the New Testament. And if it isn't, it should be. Take on the attitude of Christ. Once you do that, everything else falls into place. Rehoboam was, com was comparing himself to the wrong person. We should be comparing ourselves to Christ. And it says in verse 12, So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king had directed. Verse 13, the king answered them harshly. And King Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the elders. He said, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to it. My father disciplined you with whips. I will discipline you with scorpions. Wow. His father used whips. Ouch. That just hurts thinking about it. But the thing is, a scorpion? That's worse than a whip. A whip you'll recover from. It might leave scars, but you'll recover from a scorpion? Maybe, maybe not. <coughs> For all of his faults... When Solomon began his reign, he talked about the people being God's people. When God came to him and said, what do you want? He said, if I'm going to serve your people, your people, i got to have wisdom because I can't do this on my own. There was a sense of humility and a sense of love there that Rehoboam is totally missing. Rehoboam cared absolutely nothing for the people. He knew they had been burned by the taxes, and he says, I'm just going to make them worse. Rehoboam cared for no one but himself. Jesus said the greatest commandment in the Old Testament was to love God and love your neighbor. Rehoboam doesn't give much indication at all about his attitude towards God, but he plainly does not love his people. If we are to begin well, we have to seek God to counsel, use Christ as a model, and make love a priority. In our daily lives, love of God, love of neighbor has to be a priority. And understand what that word neighbor entails. Someone asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And he told the story of the Good Samaritan. Wait a second, you mean i got to love those guys? Yes. Jesus says you've heard love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, no, 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 no. Love your enemy. You mean we got to love those guys? If I'm a Democrat, i got to love Republicans. If I'm a Republican, i got to love Democrats. Yeah. I wish our two national parties could hear that. Because I have been dismayed at the junk being thrown back and forth. 
but I'm not getting the politics this morning because that's not what I'm all about. There are, according to the Greek language, and you see this in the New Testament, three types of love. There's eros, a love between a husband and a wife. Phileto, brotherly love. And agape, godly love. A friend of mine wants to find agape love as God's love for the unlovable despite their unlovability. Yes, there are some people that are not very lovable. I'm sure that as, as Rehoboam looked out at the people, there are some people out there that would be very, very difficult to love. But he was the one that's being called to be their king. He was called to love them, to serve them. We need to love our neighbor. Someone asked, how do you do that? How do you make yourself feel something for somebody? Some of you may have heard of C.S. Lewis, a theologian from the 20th century. He wrote a book called Mere Christianity. And in it he wrote, do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you're behaving as if you love someone, you presently will come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him more. If you do him a good turn, you will find yourself disliking him less. Making love a priority. What I like about the good news Jesus Christ brought to this earth is there's always a time for a new beginning. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, where you've come from. There's always a chance for a new beginning. Whatever has happened in the past can be left behind, and you can start over anew. If we seek and accept godly counsel, if we use Christ as a model, if we make love a priority, God can and will do amazing things in our lives. Here we have the story of the fall of the kingdom of Israel being broken in two. Rehoboam's reign did not begin very well. And what little bit we have of his reign, it frankly didn't get much better. But we can learn from what he did and from what he did not do. Seek out godly counsel. But use Christ as a model. And make love a priority. And then after that, of course, trust the Holy Spirit to take it from there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you in your house, seeking to make a new beginning, Father. There's some, there's some among us that we have said and done things we should not have done. Father, we need to make things right. So, Father, we repent of our sins, we acknowledge our sin, and we pledge ourselves to do things differently. Father, we ask that you might help us to seek out your godly counsel, your Holy Spirit, your Holy Word, the godly men and women that you have placed in our lives. Father, as we consider this person called Jesus Christ, help us to use him as a model. Help us to imitate him in all that we do. And Father, whatever we do or don't do, help us to make love a priority in our lives. Father, we love you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.